This evening we are continuing in our series, Doctrine Matters, and we're bringing our section on the doctrine of salvation to a close. And what we're going to do this evening is answer a very simple question. Are the saved secure? You recall last week we considered a positive description of what the Bible says with regards to a believer's salvation. The argument was made that a genuine Christian, a person that is saved, is eternally secure. Their salvation cannot be taken away. And we saw the lines of argument were as follows. A believer is secure because of the divine purpose. The divine purpose in salvation is that when God calls somebody to himself, he will also glorify that individual. The sovereign purpose in salvation is to see to it that these people are given to the Son and the Son will have them as his inheritance for all eternity. In addition to the divine purpose, we spoke about the divine promise. Scripture states very clearly in many verses that believers are secure. We are in Christ's hand and and nobody can snatch us out of it. We are in the Father's hand and we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, we spoke about, in addition to the promise, the protection, the divine protection, a protection in which we are told that we are kept in the faith. And finally, we discuss the divine petition. The very prayer of Jesus Christ is praying for us, praying that we be protected, praying that we make it to glory, and Jesus gets what he asks for. So we saw from those four lines of evidence a positive argument that the believer, the true believer, the individual that has been called, justified, in the process of being sanctified and will one day be glorified, will be eternally secure. But there are people who still object to this. And one of the main reasons people object to this is there are a number of scriptures that are allegedly problem passages. And these passages seem to give the indication that a true believer is able to lose their salvation. They are able to fall away from the faith. Now this evening, I don't have the time to be able to look at every single one of these problem passages because each and every one of them by themselves could be something we could delve into very deeply. There is a particular book in the New Testament that is often used to describe this debate and that is seen in the area of the book of Hebrews. Uh, The book of Hebrews has these five warning passages, but even those five passages, we don't have the time to look at all of them this evening. So we are going to focus our attention on one of those passages in the book of Hebrews, and that is Hebrews chapter 6, verses 4 to 12. Now, for many of you, just the mention of Hebrews 6 immediately raises the idea of controversy. This is a passage that is debated by so many people. All sorts of thoughts and ideas have come to our minds. And what I want to be able to do this evening is show you why this passage does indeed affirm that the saved are secure. This is not a problematic passage. It is a tough passage, I grant that. But it's not a problematic passage. It is actually one that very positively affirms the eternal security of the people of God. At the same time, issuing a very serious warning. And we'll look at that very closely in just a moment. So let's begin with a reading of God's word. And that is beginning in Hebrews chapter 6 from verse 4 down to verse 8. Though our study this evening will take us down to verse 12. Let's begin with this reading. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift and have shared in the Holy Spirit and have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away to restore them again to repentance since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. The land that has drunk the rain 
that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it was cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed and its end is to be burned. That is the reading of God's word. The question before us this evening in this passage is who is the writer of the Hebrews talking about in these verses? The individuals that he is speaking of are a group of individuals who have experienced spiritual qualities. We'll look at them closely in just a moment. And in, in experiencing these qualities, the writer says that it is impossible of these individuals that if they fall away, to restore them again to repentance. Some people will make the argument that the individuals that the writer is talking about are Christians. Yet these Christians have compromised, and as a result of this compromise, they have fallen out of the faith. And as a consequence of falling out of the faith, we are told in verse 4 that it is impossible to restore them. And for this reason, some people live with a great anxiety, worried that they may be in this category. Is Hebrews 6, verses 4 to 6 specifically, and then the broader context, talking about a person who was once saved and have now lost their salvation? Some people will make the argument that this passage is not talking about somebody who was saved, but it's talking about somebody who claimed to be saved, but in the end have demonstrated that they are not converted. Well, what I want to do this evening is share with you two points. And I want to carefully analyze this text. And in analyzing the text, I want to be able to show you in our conclusion who this passage is talking about and how this passage relates to the whole topic of whether a Christian is secure or not when it comes to their salvation. I have two points. Now, the first one is found in verses 4 and it's going to take us all the way through to verse 8. And what we're going to see in those verses is a serious warning. A serious warning. And secondly... In verses 9 to 12, we're going to talk about the security of the warning. So this is a warning passage. But the first part of the passage issues something very, very serious for us to take notice to. But the second part of the passage provides the readers with a security, a security of salvation in which they can find refuge and rest in. So let's begin, first of all, with the serious warning. Now, we need to remind ourselves of the context of this entire book. This is a letter written to the Hebrews. Now, we don't know who the author is. From time to time, when I speak on any passage in Hebrews, I might accidentally fall into that default saying, Paul said... And I don't know if that is a hidden conviction in my heart or if that's just because I'm used to going through all of Paul's letters. We don't really know who wrote the book of Hebrews. We know it was given to us under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. But it's clear who it's written to. It's written to Hebrews. And here is a group of individuals who have come out of Judaism and have embraced the Christian faith. And the writer, interestingly enough, tells us that he writes this very short word of exhortation. It's not a short word at all when you read it. But nonetheless, when you read through this book, you get the sense that this is a sermon. It is a pastoral letter. And this letter is designed to strengthen believers in the faith. But like every crowd of believers, there are those who aren't genuinely the Lord's. There are always going to be weeds um, infested into the life of the church. So we need to be aware that as the writer writes this book, he writes with the assumption that individuals who profess faith in Christ are in the Lord, but he does not know the heart condition of every reader. So he issues some very serious warnings 
throughout this book. And the very first warning that we're going to look at this evening is found in verses 4 through to 6. Now, in these few verses, you will notice how he makes the argument that the group of individuals he describes with four particular descriptions in verse 4 have fallen away. And he says that if these individuals fall away, it is impossible to restore them again unto repentance. Now, notice how these individuals, who he describes as the ones who are impossible to restore if they fall away, described under the headings as having once been enlightened, having tasted the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, and then moving over to next, the next verse in verse 5, we see that they have tasted of the goodness of the word of God and of the powers of the age to come. Now, when you read that description, that fourfold description sounds like a Christian, right? We're talking about somebody who has gone from darkness to light, somebody who partakes in the Holy Spirit, individuals that have tasted good things, tasted the word and, and tasted the sweetness of the heavenly gift. And for, some re- for, for, for this very reason, some people will say, see, these four descriptions argue that this individual is indeed a Christian. Well, let me make a few observations with regards to these four descriptions and have a close look at verses 4 and 5 as we see those descriptions there in those verses. The first observation I want to make with regards to those descriptions is that those descriptions by themselves don't necessarily describe a Christian. They can describe a Christian, but in and of themselves, these aren't what we call technical saving terms. What do I mean by that? Well, what I mean by that is, isn't it interesting that technical saving terms aren't used in this list, like the word saved, the word justified, being sanctified, adopted, These words are what we could call technical saving terms. These are objective words used in the New Testament to positively describe the sovereign activity of the Holy Spirit in the work of a person that brings them to salvation. Other words even like regeneration. These words aren't used in the list. But the terms that are used here most certainly do describe a Christian, but these words by themselves don't necessarily describe a Christian. It is possible for a person to experience the things in verses 4 and 5 and not be saved, but it is impossible for a person to experience regeneration, justification, conversion, sanctification, and even glorification, and not be a Christian. You see the difference? So that's the first thing to observe in this text. These four descriptions that we have in verses 4 and 5 aren't exclusive terms used in a technical sense to describe salvation. But here is a second observation to make with regards to this text. Think of the parallel between the individuals the writer is describing in verses 4 and 5 and really in the whole book of Hebrews with the Hebrew people in the Old Testament. Was the entire nation of Israel saved? Well, the answer is no. Let's zoom in a little bit further. Was the entire generation that got taken out of the land of Egypt saved? The answer is no. In fact, that entire generation didn't go into the promised land. And the reason they didn't go into the promised land was because of their stubborn unbelief. Now get this. Those people were in a crowd who got delivered from Egypt. 
And as they were delivered from Egypt, what were some of their experiences as they wandered through the wilderness? What guided them by night? This great light. They were an enlightened people. This light was before them. Not only did they have this light before them, we are told that they tasted of the heavenly gift. Manna from heaven was given to this crowd. In addition to being able to taste of that heavenly gift, they became partakers in the work of the Spirit. They saw the wonders of the work of God through miraculous acts. They saw the divine hand of God split open the waters when they crossed through the sea. They saw the miracles, they heard the miracles that were performed by the hands of Moses. Even as they traveled through the wilderness, they saw the great works of God. Moses himself was the prophet of the Lord. In this sense, they were in the company of the work of the Holy Spirit. And having that affiliation, being partakers, they became individuals who were exposed to the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, let me just um, continue on and look at a, another few of these features, and I want to make a bit of a comparison in the rest of the New Testament. In, in addition to that, we see that the people of God, the, 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 the nation of Israel that had been delivered from the land of Egypt as, as they wandered through the wilderness, were also exposed to other positive experiences. They received the word of God. They actually heard the law of God read out to them. God revealed it to Moses. They heard it. They understood it. And in addition to this, they continued to taste the great goodness of God. They knew what it was that when they actually complied with what God had said, they had blessing over their enemies. They had deliverance. They had these very positive experiences. Now, when you see the people experience such things as this, enlightened, tasting the heavenly gift in the Old Testament, being exposed to the wonders of the Word of God, being partakers of the great workings of God through the Holy Spirit in the life of His prophets, and also benefiting from the overflow of blessing, there you would have seen a group of people who on the outside would appear to be saved. But isn't it interesting that that people, by means of their stubborn unbelief, started going through these cycles of complaint. Oh, it was far better back in Egypt. We had leeks and onions back there. They complained. They were complaining and complaining and complaining. They were taking their eyes off mighty God. And there were consequences. In the end... Those people were unable to go into the land of Canaan. They got to taste of God's goodness. They got to experience the goodness of God. They got to experience firsthand the blessing of God. They knew what it was to hear answered prayer. They knew what it was to see the joy of victory in the Lord. They saw the power of God's hand. But those people were not allowed to go into the land. They showed themselves to be stubborn in their unbelief. Now, the two observations I've given you, I think, are rather significant. The first observation is to note that the fourfold description in Hebrews 6, verses 4 and 5, is a description that can indeed describe a believer. No question about it. But the descriptions by themselves are not enough to say categorically that that person is saved. They're not the technical terms of the New Testament to definitively define a believer. They're not the words used in the golden chain of salvation in Romans 8. And secondly, the descriptions found in Hebrews 6 verses 4 and 5 parallel in a very interesting way the Hebrews of the Old Testament. But I want to also make a, a third point. The third observation would be this. 
Take a consideration of each of these descriptions and trace them through the New Testament and you will find these descriptions used, yes, to describe believers, but you'll also see them used in ways that don't necessarily describe a believer. It is possible for somebody to claim that they're a Christian and say that they've been enlightened. All of a sudden, they move away from an ignorance and they actually will say, I have heard the word of God and I get it. I understand it. We might be able to say that these individuals have been called, but not in the effectual sense, in the general sense. Remember, we talked about calling. In the Bible, there are two types of calling. There is the general call that goes out to everybody and people can resist that. People can receive that. But then secondly, there is what's called an effectual calling, and that is the calling that is always used in all of the New Testament letters to describe a call that is irresistible. It is a call where God sovereignly calls that individual to himself, and they come. They come willingly by the power of God's sovereign grace. Well, these individuals have heard the call, but they haven't responded in that in that. Second sense, they've come to a knowledge. What used to be night seems to be day to them now. They understand the Bible. They understand the commands. They get it. And in this sense, they have experienced a form of light. Now, I want you to note that in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 18, we have a description of the believer who has been illuminated. They've experienced light and it's um, compared to receiving glory. But in that verse, it talks about us going from glory to glory, going from a small bit of light to a larger amount of light. I think we can make the argument that it is possible for somebody to receive light, to receive understanding, and that receiving of light and understanding in and of itself is not conversion, It may be an initial step to being converted because we can't believe if we don't first hear. But hearing in and of itself, having an understanding by itself does not automatically make somebody a believer. Consider the other concept, and that is the description um, found in verse 4, is that they tasted the heavenly gift. How can somebody who's not truly converted taste? Well, the idea of taste means to experience. Somebody who has not truly been justified can still experience the heavenly gift. Just as the people of Israel were able to taste the manna and not be saved, somebody is able to taste the teaching of the word of God. It grieves my heart when I've met individuals who come into the church And initially, I'm excited because I see their excitement and they just seem to get it. They hear the word, they respond to it, and they start tasting of it and they share how much they're enjoying the word of God. And all of a sudden, after some time, they make a point, a decision in which they definitively reject it. And when I saw the tasting, I thought that was real. They seem to be enjoying it, but this tasting by itself, yes, is true of a Christian. A Christian will taste the heavenly gift, but that in and of itself is not a saving term. What about partakers of the Holy Spirit? It seems to be a tough one. How can you be a partaker of of the Holy Spirit and not be saved? Well, it's true that the word partaker is used in the New Testament to describe somebody who is actually converted. But the word by itself isn't sufficiently strong enough to say that this word actually describes somebody who is truly converted. To be a partaker just simply means to be in affiliation with, to be connected with. And if this is describing an individual that's not saved, this would be describing an individual that was in the company of the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does a work in 
in converting people. The Holy Spirit energizes spiritual gifts. The Holy Spirit works in our midst in this way. The Holy Spirit even works in the lives of unbelievers in which he brings conviction. He convicts the world of their unrighteousness and of sin. These individuals have partaken in this. <clears throat> They've had a connection, an affiliation with this work of the Spirit. And finally, they have also tasted of the gift of God's Word and of things to come. They've heard the preaching of the Word of God. In addition to hearing the preaching of the Word of God, they have also experienced the great power of the things to come. They have seen the work of God transforming in the lives of people. And they may even believe that that is, that is what God is going to continue to unfold throughout this world. He is doing a great work in this church. He's doing a great work in that church. And God is unfolding this great plan. And we can see that this is the power of God. People's lives are being transformed. They've been enlightened. Interestingly enough, the word enlightened, not so much in the first century, so I don't think we can make an argument for it in the book of Hebrews, but by the time you come to the second century, it was a word commonly used to describe somebody who was baptized. And the second one, that they've tasted the heavenly gift, some have argued that this is describing the fact that they participated in the Lord's table. When it talks about being a partaker of the Holy Spirit, some have identified that with them, someone laying hands on them, perhaps setting them aside to a task of ministry so that they could serve in the church. All of this seems to just describe these external acts in the life of a church that are true of genuine Christians. Genuine Christians will seek to be baptized. A genuine Christians will partake in the Lord's table and genuine Christians will be set aside to serve. But those signs on the outside don't necessarily prove that a person is converted. So I'd make the argument that what we have here in verses 4 to 6 is a description of what a true Christian will look like, but also a description of what somebody who is not truly saved looks like. And in the case of the warning, it is talking to those who have not genuinely been converted, saying, if you who have experienced these things fall away, it is impossible to restore you again to repentance. Now, I want you to notice what he means when he says, fall away. This is not talking about somebody who one day spoke in a way that was inappropriate in the context of the church. Perhaps they decided to sin. Does that mean they've fallen away? No, that's not what he's describing at all. We are not talking about the normal struggle of a believer in which we sin. We're not talking about somebody who even goes through a season of compromise here. The falling away here is far more serious. Some Bible translations have translated this apostatize. But literally, the idea is of of one who falls away, and this falling away has come as a result of them experiencing those four descriptions, and they have actually seen the truth. They've heard it. They've understood it. They've said, I get it. They have responded by saying, I want to now partake in the life of the community of God's people. They are affirming with their own lips that God is at work, that Jesus Christ is mighty God, that the Spirit of God is working. But then after a time, this individual comes to the point and says, I, after knowing all of this, am going to turn my back on it I now no longer believe. This individual, the writer says, has entered into a serious state of unbelief. They have become so hardened to the things of God, they have openly denied the faith. This is a definitive rejection, not a season of compromise. The writer says, an individual that gets that deep in their rejection of the truth after being exposed to so much. It's impossible to restore someone like that back. Why is it impossible? It's impossible because this individual 
has become so hardened that they're no longer sensitive to the truth. Paraphrasing Wayne Grudem, Grudem makes the point that the impossibility is seen in the experience in which you can engage with this individual. You could say to them, but listen, the, the word of God says this. And the individual will say, I know that. And I heard that. And I once believed that. But I don't want it. The person will go on and say, but you can experience the blessings of God if you taste of the wonders of God's word. And this individual will say, but I did. I experienced that. I tasted it, changed my life for a time, but I reject that. I don't want anything to do with it. They'll add, but the Holy Spirit is at work in people's lives. He is transforming people who used to oppose the things of God. Their lives were lived for themselves and for no explanation within themselves. They came to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ and they love the Lord. They love Jesus and they're now serving him in the church. And the individuals say, yeah, I've seen that. Happened to me too. I experienced this great transformation and there seemed to be a, a strong desire within me, but I don't want it. I don't believe that to be of God. The individual will remind them, that God is doing a work in his people and this work is a demonstration of the great power that is to come, that Christ will return one day and set up a kingdom. He goes, yeah, I get all that, but I just don't believe it. You see, this individual doesn't want to come to repentance. It is impossible to restore this individual because this individual has become so hardened. This is a pharaoh. This is an individual whose heart has been hardened. This is a Judas Iscariot. Man that saw with his own eyes that Jesus was the real deal. He knew that Jesus was not a con. He knew Jesus was not like the Pharisees. He saw the miracles that Christ performed. Judas even participated in the power of the Holy Spirit by carrying out works of righteousness and, and miracles and ministry of mercy. In the gospel accounts, when Jesus sent them out, he was a partaker in the Holy Spirit. Yet Judas Iscariot rejected Christ. He became so deep in his unbelief. The writer to Hebrews writes to his readers and says, I have a serious warning. The seriousness of my warning is this. That if you get yourself into that place so deep, you will enter into the point of no return. It be impossible to restore you. It will be impossible to bring you back. Now, I want to point out something very interesting. Some people struggle with this passage, and they will note perhaps a few of these, but particularly description number three. They will say that these individuals shared in the Holy Spirit, verse 4. And they will note that that same word for shared is used to describe the Christian's experience in chapter 3 and verse 6, that we share with Christ. But I want you to note that we are told in Hebrews 3 and verse 6, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. I want you to note that in the book of Hebrews, we learn that there is a partaking in Christ, but this partaking in Christ, this sharing in Christ, will evidence our salvation if we persevere. Note verse 14. For we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. The evidence of our genuine sharing with Christ is if a believer perseveres. The fact that these individuals abandon the things of Christ reveal that they never truly shared in Christ to begin with. Now, I want you to notice one more thing before we look at our second point, which is going to be rather quick. 
So don't be alarmed by the length of time we spent on our first point when we come to our second point. But the, the, the next thing I want to show you under the seriousness of this warning is a very interesting illustration which I think confirms this interpretation. He goes on to say in verse 7, For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned. Now notice what the writer does there. He says there are two kinds of soil. Both of these soils receive rain. And the rain is absorbed, it's all taken in, but in the end, one soil will produce a fruitful crop. The second soil will produce thorns. And what he's saying here is this, that when I look at both of them, both of them are soil. I, I don't really know which one is good and which one's not. But what will reveal the one that is good and the one that is not is that after it has gone through the the time period of receiving the water on it, it will either persevere by means of bringing forth fruit and thus showing that it is real, or it will bring forth thorns and thistles, revealing that it's not. And what passage of Scripture does that make you immediately think of when the writer to the Hebrews gives that? It is Matthew 13, the parable of the soils. And there Jesus describes four different hearts, but ultimately he's only describing two. He is describing the heart of a believer and the heart of an unbeliever. And what he says is, a sower went out to sow. The seed represents the word of God. And as the sower sows the seed, he throws it onto these different soils. The first soil was a hardened soil. And what happens is the seed is there, but the seed doesn't penetrate. The birds of the air just come and eat it up. And that heart, that soil, represents the stubborn heart, the heart that resists and refuses to listen to the things of God. But then Jesus said there is a second soil, and what happens is the seed takes root. And then all of a sudden, something begins to grow, but it's a stony ground. And this stony ground, what happens is as the plant begins to grow, the sun shines down upon it. And because it is so shallow, it withers up and it bears no fruit. That represents the shallow heart. Thirdly, there is another kind of soil. The seed um, is planted. It begins to grow. And it begins to look really, really good, but the problem is mixed into there are weeds and it begins to strangle that. And this particular um, description is, is talking about a person who is excited about the things of God, but all of a sudden they are strangled by the things of the world. And finally, there is a good soil where the seed is planted, it grows and it brings forth fruit. On the surface, they're all soil. And in this serious warning, he says, these individuals who have fallen away have demonstrated that they were actually a corrupt soil to begin with. That is why there wasn't fruit. Now, that's the seriousness of the warning. So that would seem to argue that this passage is not actually saying that if you're a Christian, you can lose your salvation. What it is indicating is that a person who claims to be a Christian but never truly got converted can walk away and fall away. And those who fall away are among those who were never truly saved. But I did say that this passage also has comfort for a Christian. Because have a look now at verses 9 to 12 in closing. We move from the seriousness of the warning to the security of the warning. 
And this is why I believe that the individuals mentioned in verses 4 to 6 aren't saved. Because what does the writer now say? It is very clear. Listen, though we speak in this way, though I'm describing people who had all these external signs of being saved, but fell away. Listen, he says, though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. You're different. You have received salvation. There's the word. There is the word that describes that eternal condition, the condition that cannot be lost. Those individuals who only had those outward signs, that is not what saves. But you, he says to my readers, I see better things, things that relate to salvation. And remember, salvation is something that is comes as a package. It is past, present, future. When you were converted, you were saved. You, the penalty of sin was removed. When you become a Christian, you are being saved. The power of sin is being conquered. And if you are a Christian, you will be saved because in the future, the presence of sin will be removed away from you once and for all. And the writer to Hebrews uses the word in its past tense, but he also uses it in its future tense in this book. And here he says to his readers in verse 9 that we are sure of better things, things that belong to salvation with regards to you. He goes on to say, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. The writer mentions this because he wants the true saints to persevere on in the faith, knowing that those that are truly saved will, but he calls for them to be faithful, to pursue these Great things. So in the end, Hebrews 6, verses 4 through to 12, is a passage that tells us that it is a very serious thing for somebody to claim to be a Christian and not truly take the things of God with its full seriousness and then reject it. This passage also tells us that it is a secure thing to truly be a child of God because better things will happen. Salvation is at work in their hearts. God has begun a work in us that he will complete until the day of redemption. Well, with that, I want to bring this study to a close and that brings our section on the doctrine of salvation to a close. And I trust that the things that we've considered as we've specifically talked about in previous weeks, the, the author the accomplishment and the application of salvation and then looking at this area of security that we have been strengthened in these things concerning the word of God. Let me pray and then I'm going to invite um, Pastor Craig to join me at the front and we're going to have some questions if you have any tonight. Let us pray. Father, thank you for what we could talk about this evening. We are grateful for your word, even in tough passages like this. Uh, we know that we're not always going to see eye to eye with uh, learned brothers and sisters in the Lord on this, but help us to note that in the end, regardless of our disagreements, that we would know the security of salvation, that we would know that when you do a work, you perform this work to the end. Now help us to know that those who are saved aren't unwrapped in justification, don't have sanctification stripped off them, and don't have their glorification removed. We thank you that this is a work that you do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.